Good to have you guys back. So um, I thought that the Fourier lectures were good because they went from you know theory to application. I hope the homeworks were, were OK. I hope they weren't too, too involved for you. Yeah? What's the feedback? How were the homeworks? They were due today, so you must have done them. Well, you extended the deadline. You extended the deadline. Ah, <laughs> that's why nobody has any idea. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> All right. All right. Shame on me. I didn't know that. Okay. So let me start with a little bit of summary of where we are. Um, we have a process where we have some observed variable x that makes some contribution to an observed value y, and we have some unknown w, and <clears throat> we did a Coleman filter based on the notion that our observation y in trial n is some linear combination of x and w in that trial plus some noise epsilon, where this noise is uh, mean zero and variance sigma squared. This is a scalar. And so we, we drove our a common filter as follows. We said that, well, we begin with some estimate of w, or prior, we call it, trial one, given that we've had no previous observations and we have some uncertainty about that estimate, p of one given zero. w is a vector, p is a matrix describing the uncertainty that we have. And then we will update our beliefs as follows. We say that um, our, after we've seen some data, we're going to update our prior belief based on the difference between what we observed, y of n, minus what we predicted, x of n transpose w of n, n minus 1. So this is our prediction error. This was the common gain, which is a, a vector here. This was our prior. This is called our posterior. <coughs> so we drove what was k. We said that we want to find the vector k so that after we estimate our posterior, our uncertainty about the posterior will be as small as possible. And so we found the k that minimized the trace of the posterior of our, uh, of our estimate. And that k was the ratio of two things. The ratio of, on the denominator, we had the um, uncertainty about our measurement. So you look at this measurement equation here. This measurement equation, its variance, is x of n transpose uncertainty, p of n, n minus 1, x of n, plus sigma squared. So that's my variance about the measurement. I put a minus 1 on it because I want to weigh my uncertainty about my, my estimate, which is my prior uncertainty, times x of n. So this equation, the common gain, is a ratio between my uncertainty about the parameter that I'm trying to estimate, p, and this is the noise, measurement noise, which is basically, it's saying that take whatever is it that you have your error, so here's your prediction error, and you want to weigh it by the ratio between the uncertainty that you have about your estimate to the measurement noise. Okay, so that's my, uh, my common gain. After I update my unknown, w, I'm going to have an uncertainty about my posterior, p of n given n. And that was this relationship. So this is the posterior uncertainty. And um, this, this tells me that basically, um, now that I have a mean associated with my estimate, 
this is the variance associated with that estimate. And basically, the variance gets smaller the more data I get. OK, and so now what I do is that I, I, I find the um, weight on the next trial. So th what I do is that I say the prior on the next trial is my posterior on the previous trial. The uncertainty prior on the next trial is the uncertainty posterior on the previous trial. So in this model, I'm assuming that from data point to data point, there's no change in my W parameter. And so therefore, I'm just going to push forward in time my posterior in one trial to become the prior in the previous trial. So let's go over this together one more time. I start with a prior belief. Before I see any data, I have some estimate of the mean and I have some uncertainty about that estimate. I make a measurement, y. I compare it to my prediction. Here it is. I have an error. I multiply it by this vector gain that leads to an update in my estimate. That update in the estimate depends on this gain, k, common gain. That, that is a ratio between my uncertainty about my belief, what is it that I'm estimating, and my measurement noise. I update my uncertainty about my belief after I've taken a measurement, and then I use these means to become the, um, uh, the um, priors in the next trial. So let me stop for a second, see if you have any questions about this process. So the common gain is a ratio between two things. What is it that you're measuring? That's the noise, the uncertainty in your measurement. That goes in the denominator. And the numerator is the uncertainty about your belief. What is it that you know? Your prior. That tells you how to weigh the prediction error. When the prediction error is large, well, when the prediction error, whatever it is, if you have a lot of uncertainty about your belief, so if this, this P here is large, what that means is that I, I don't really, you know, um, have a whole lot of uh, belief in what I know. I'm, I'm pretty uncertain about it. What that does is that it makes K large, which means you're going to learn a lot from the error. On the other hand, if what you're measuring is pretty noisy, then what this is saying is that you should not really learn a lot from your prediction error because it just could be noise. Okay. All right, so let's consider a simple uh, modification of our process. <clears throat> and um, when we have a scenario where um, we're trying to estimate the parameter x, and that gives us the observation y. And we believe that x changes from one time to another by some matrix A. And that gives us also the observation Y. So our model looks like this. We say that we have a dynamical system that changes from one trial to the next as follows. So X is the state of our system. Maybe it's an N by one. It depends on some dynamics described by matrix A. This is an n by n. And it's affected by some noise epsilon x, which is an n by 1. And this epsilon x is noise properties defined by a random process that has a Gaussian shape to it, mean 0, and variance covariance matrix Q. I make an observation y. That's related to x by some matrix C. And there's some noise that influences my observation. So maybe my observation is an m by 1. And the c then is an m by n. And this noise, epsilon y, also is Gaussian with variance q. <coughs> Sorry, variance r. So here's my dynamical system, represented by this graphical model like this. I have some state x that is changing based on this matrix A. And I measure my state x through some matrix C that gives me observation y. So maybe x is position, velocity, acceleration, and what I'm measuring is just position, maybe, or some component of that state. I can't see all of that state. And what I want to do is that what's the best estimate of the state x 
given that I have observation y. Okay, so you have this model of dynamics. You have to know what is C, what is A, what is Q, what is R. You have to know the noise. You have to know the dynamics of the system. You measure y. You want to estimate x. And so we're going to use the common filter to do that. We're going to start with a prior. We're going to have some belief at the very beginning that the state is at some, some location and I have some uncertainty about my belief. So I have some x at the very beginning. I believe it's some location. And I have some variance about that x. So what I do is that I update my belief based on my prior plus some gain times the difference between what I observed minus what I predicted. So what is what I predict? Well, that's c times x of n, n minus 1. My prior times the matrix c is what I should be getting, but what I'm getting is y. So I have the difference between my prediction and my observation. So what should k be? k is the ratio of my uncertainty by my belief to the measurement noise. So what is the measurement noise? It's the variance of this equation. What is the variance of this equation? It's c times variance of x, which is the uncertainty, the prior uncertainty, c transpose, plus what's the variance of epsilon y? That's r minus 1. So this quantity is going to be an m by m. This is an n by m. This is an n by n. And now k becomes a matrix, n by m. <clears throat> yeah. So in the normal model, do you set that initial prior to the mean and the sum function of the variances? Yeah, so you might start with 0. That's where I believe x to be. You make a measurement, then you're going to update it. One of the more interesting questions is that what should your uncertainty be? So uh, I just want to make sure you're asking about x and p? Yeah, your initial problem. What should that be? You have to start someplace. The nice thing is that it'll quickly converge to where it's supposed to. No matter where you start, it's going to quickly converge from the measurements you make. OK, so that's our gain. That's our common gain. What's our uncertainty about the state x? So x is what we're estimating here. What's my uncertainty about it? My posterior uncertainty is the identity matrix times the common gain, times c, times the prior uncertainty. OK, so this is my posterior uncertainty. This is my estimate of x. This is my common gain. On the next trial, what's my prior? On the next trial, x of n plus 1 given n is going to be dependent on my model. So this is my model here, a times x. So that's a times x of n given n. What's my posterior uncertainty, my prior uncertainty on the next trial? This is the posterior uncertainty. What's, what's the prior on the next trial? That depends on also this equation. It's the variance of this equation, which is a times p of n given n, a transpose plus, so variance of this, plus variance of epsilon x, which is q. Let me see if I can reduce it so you can see it on the same page. So here was our model. X changes in time based on a matrix A. I make measurement Y. And what I want to know is that how can I estimate X given my measurement Y? Well, here's how you do it. You begin with a prior. You make a measurement Y. You update your belief based on the difference between what you predicted you should see and what you saw based on this matrix K. Here now the common gain is a matrix. You update your state. 
you update your uncertainty about the state based on the common gain and the prior uncertainty, you move forward in time, you, you say now the posterior that I had is going to be the prior on the next trial based on the matrix A because that's the dynamics of your system. The uncertainty about the state is going to be the variance of the dynamics, this here. So it's A, P A N given N, A transpose plus Q. And in this way, you can have a system that has many hidden states. X, you can't measure X. You have measurement Y, which is just a subset of these X's. It's related to that X via some, you know, matrix C. This allows you to uncover those hidden states. So I'll give you an example of this. Um, in a field of neuroscience called the brain-machine interface, what they do is that they measure activity of lots of neurons in the brain. What they want to know is that what is the animal trying to do? So they want to know what is the state that the animal is trying to move a robot. So the robot has this position, velocity, and what they measure is a whole bunch of neural activity in the brain of this animal. So that's their why. They want to know what does the animal want to do, which is x. So through more or less what you're seeing here, the Coleman filter, they estimate the intention of the animal. They move the robotic arm by measuring neural activity. That's the basic idea in brain-machine interfaces. Neurons are doing something, that's your measurement. The intention of the animal or the human being is to move something, that's X, and you want to understand what's the relationship between those two. So in those paradigms, one, one has to fit these parameters, C, A, the noises, Q and R. You have to find that out. And you know I haven't shown you how to do that, but we will. We'll get to that. But the basic idea is, how do you go from the measurement to the hidden state X? And that's one of the problems in the brain-machine interface world. Yeah? For A and C, can you encode time-dependent information? Or yeah, is it as long as you know it. Okay. Absolutely. If it's time-dependent, it's no problem. But, but you have to know it before you can apply this. Noises can also change. And we'll go over some of the examples of it. So um, one of the questions that was asked was that how do we start this process? What should be our uncertainty? So the state, the mean, the mean of what you believe the state is at, might as well pick zero. Why not? But what about the uncertainty? What should that be? And what I want to show you is that how do we get that initial uncertainty? And this will link our theory to maximum likelihood. Because if you remember, in maximum likelihood, we made some measurements, and then we had a statistical model of how our measurements are related to our hidden states. And we said, what's the most likely hidden state that would give us these measurements? And we maximized the likelihood, and we found some estimate. What we didn't have was prior. We didn't have a concept of a prior. So, you know, it's like you have two GPSs that you use to go hiking, you take a measurement here, you take a measurement here, and then you combine them, right? Well, sometimes if you just combine the two, it doesn't give you a measurement that makes sense. So if one of them says, I'm on the left side of the river, the other one says, I'm right side of the river, well, you're not in the middle of the river. So there, you'd have to apply a prior. With the Coleman filter, we have seen how we can apply priors, right? Because priors are combined with observations to give you your posterior. So now what I want to show you is what happens if you don't have a prior. And we're going to see that if you don't have a prior, the solution of the common filter is just like maximum likelihood. And as we're doing the math, we'll also learn something about how to set that initial uncertainty, which is, you know, what, how, you know I have a mean. I also need to have an uncertainty about it. How do I do it? And, you know, the natural thing to say is that, well, I don't know anything about this parameter, so my uncertainty is infinity. Well, infinity, we can't really deal with it in a matrix form. So that becomes problematic. So you have to come up with some uncertainty. So what should it be? So I'll show you what it should be. All right. So 
So, in principle, our Kalman filter is related to our uncertainty as follows. In the model that I just showed you, So this is what I just wrote for the dynamical system that we were considering, right? This just this equation here. I just rewrote it down here for you. And, and we also had our posterior uncertainty that looks like this. So let's just multiply this through. That becomes... I'm going to now plug in K. All right, so all I did is that I just wrote this posterior uncertainty in terms of this is K. I just, I just plugged in what K is. All right. So I want to simplify this equation, which is a whole bunch of matrices that are being multiplied by each other. An, an important and useful linear algebra technique is called matrix inversion lemma. And it goes like this. If you have some matrix Z, minus matrix X times inverse Y times X transpose, that inverse is equal to Z minus 1 plus Z minus 1 X, Y minus X transpose Z minus 1 X minus 1 X transpose Z minus 1. So pretty obscure little lemma, but this is the case. This is indeed true. So what I want to show you is that how we can use this lemma to do something interesting with our equation here. So look at this equation. So it has this term here, the posterior, the prior uncertainty. This looks pretty close to what we have, what I've written here. It has this term that's being inverted. It has a couple of items inside the inversion matrix here. So there's a Y here that looks like an R. This looks like this. Then there's this term here that's multiplying it, just like this. And then there's this uh, terms that come after it. So indeed, what I have is that this P looks like this Z. C transpose looks like this X. And then R looks like this Y. So if I write Z minus 1 is equal to minus the prior uncertainty. If I like, write x is equal to c transpose, if I write y is equal to r, then what I have is the following. The posterior uncertainty is minus z inverse plus z inverse x, x transpose times minus z inverse times x plus y minus 1, x transpose, minus z, and minus 1. So <clears throat> just to take care of the minuses. What I get is um, the left side of this equation, which is z minus xy minus 1, x transpose, minus 1, which now if I write it in terms of the parameters that I had, that is um, uh, this z here is minus the minus p, which is p of n given n minus 1 quantity inverse plus c transpose r minus 1 c quantity inverse. So I have an interesting thing here. Let me just, so I have this posterior uncertainty now written in terms of the inverse of the prior uncertainty, whole thing quantity inverse. Let me invert both sides. So I get the posterior uncertainty inverted is equal to 
my prior uncertainty inverted plus C transpose R minus 1C. So I have the posterior uncertainty in terms of the prior uncertainty. Why is this useful? So if you have no prior, what you do is that you set P of 1 given 0 to infinity. So I have absolutely no idea of what the initial state of my system should be. What that means is that my uncertainty is infinity. What that means is that P of 1 given 1, if this is infinity, then P of 1 given 1 is going to be equal to it's going to be equal to C transpose R minus 1C. So this equation is useful because what it tells us is that if we start with absolutely no knowledge about the state of our system, P10 is infinity, then P11, after we take a data point, is going to be something. It's going to be C transpose R minus 1C. So what that means is that P of 1 given 1, after we take our data, is going to be C transpose R minus 1C inverse. Okay. So, the technique that's often used is that I just draw, I just you know, did the derivation for you that says even if you have absolutely no idea what your uncertainty is going to be after you take the first data point, this is going to be your uncertainty. So you start with that. Rather than having infinity, you just start with as if you had taken the first data point. Now, if you look at that C transpose R minus 1, C minus 1, it looks a lot like what we had when we were doing maximum likelihood. What we did in maximum likelihood was to weigh the two sources of information that we had based on the variances of those. So let me show you that this is, this is, indeed, this is indeed the case. So if this is the posterior uncertainty, then up here, um, had, um, let's see, I had a, this equation here that's, sorry, I want to write for you the, um, the common gain. From this equation. So we can compute the common gain um, after our first data point. And we can ask, you know, what is, what is our common gain after the first data point? That's equal to C transpose R minus 1, C minus 1, C transpose R minus 1. And indeed, this is what we used in maximum likelihood. We said that basically my maximum likelihood estimate was equal to, if you look back at your notes, C transpose R minus 1, C minus 1, C transpose R minus 1, Y, the measurement. So we're multiplying my measurement, Y, by the common gain to get the maximum likelihood. And that's indeed, that's indeed the case. So let me drive for you this so we can see how it's done. So K of N is P of N, N minus 1, C transpose times C P of N N minus 1 C transpose plus R minus 1. So this is, this is our equation for the common filter. So let me multiply the both sides of this so that I move the inverse to the other side. All I did is move the inverse to the other side. I'm going to multiply both sides by an R minus 1. So if I now um, multiply through, what I have is K of N, C, P of N, N minus 1, C transpose, plus K of N is equal to P of N, N minus 1, C transpose, 
r minus 1, which means k of n is going to be equal to p of n n minus 1 c transpose r minus 1 minus k of n c p of n n minus 1 c transpose r minus 1. Sorry, I forgot the r minus 1 here. which is equal to i minus k of n c So this is a useful equation because it tells me what's my common, common gain in terms of the posterior uncertainty. So the left side here, this, this term here, i minus k, c, p of n, n minus 1, this is the posterior uncertainty. So I have the common gain in terms of the posterior uncertainty, and here's the posterior uncertainty after the first data point, which is k, I can now write it in terms of the posterior uncertainty times the um, uh, C transpose R minus 1. So this term here. And I can write my maximum likelihood. So basically what this tells us is that maximum likelihood gives me the answer assuming that your prior was infinite uncertainty. That's the basic idea that I'm trying to show you here. That if you look at what we did with maximum likelihood, its meaning is that you have no prior. The common gain is the same as maximum likelihood if you had no prior. Now, as we went through the math, we also learned a little bit about um, how, how to behave if we have no uncertainty. So if we have infinite uncertainty to begin with, then what we can do is we can set our prior uncertainty to be simply what the uncertainty will be after we take our first data point, which is going to be in this case C transpose R minus 1C for the system that has the shape of that I showed you up here, for this system here. Okay, any questions? Let me stop and to see if you have any thoughts about this so far. So the basic process, you make a measurement. You want to estimate the hidden states of a system. In the case of having a, you know, a vector system X that it gets changed by some matrix A, you make some measurement Y. And given that you know the dynamics of the system A and C, you can estimate via the common filter um, the, uh, the state. Now. Um, the question was, what should our prior uncertainty be when we start the estimation process? If you have infinite uncertainty, you can still set the um, uh, prior uncertainty to be something based on our, our derivation here. Okay, so um, let's write the equations now for a more general system. So suppose we have a system that looks like this. We have a dynamics where we have some state x that is changing from trial to trial based on some input u. And we have some noise sigma x. And sigma x is normally distributed with mean 0 and variance q. We make a measurement y that depends on this hidden state x. And it's also corrupted with some noise y. And epsilon y is mean 0 and variance r. So I want to estimate x. x is the vector that we're trying to estimate. y is the measurement that we're making. So my estimate is going to have a prior that I'm going to start with. And it's going to change based on some gain that depends on my measurement minus my prediction. So what's my prediction in trial n? What's this term here that goes here?
So it's C times my prior. That's what I expect to see here, right? Because look at this noise. This noise is zero mean. So my expected number here is just the expected value of this equation, which is C times my prior, right? That's what I expect to see. Okay, and I update my belief, which is what I start with, based on the difference between my measurement and what I predicted, multiplied, in this case, by a matrix, K. And we wrote down that the matrix K is the ratio between my prior uncertainty and my measurement noise, C, P of N minus 1, C transpose plus R minus 1. So this is the measurement noise, right? This is the variance of this equation. And I update, after I take a measurement, I update my um, uncertainty So now I have my posterior mean value for the x that I'm trying to estimate and my posterior variance about that estimate. So now what I do is I say, OK, what's my prior on the next trial, x of n plus 1 given n, what's my prior on the next trial? Who can tell me the prior on the next trial? A times? Uh huh. Plus B. Good. So it's the mean of this equation. Mean of this equation, which I've written here, because epsilon x is mean zero. Now my posterior, I had a posterior uncertainty about my estimate x. I'm going to have a prior uncertainty on the next trial, p of n plus one, given n. That's going to depend on the variance of this equation. That's going to be A times P of N given N, A transpose, plus the variance of epsilon X, which is Q. Why does it depend on the variance of the input? Variance of U. Because in this case, we're assuming u is a, not a random variable. You, you imposed it. So we will insert noise in u next, and we'll see how that, that, it, that changes things. OK. So that brings us to the next topic, and that's called signal-dependent noise. which is basically we have an actuator, U, that's going to generate something, but it's not going to be noise-free. It's going to generate noise. Now, if that noise was just the normal kind of noise that we've been seeing, where its variance is independent of the mean, then it doesn't really do anything interesting for us. So if you look at this equation, if there's noise here in U, so if my equation was x of n plus 1, is equal to ax of n plus b times u, where u had noise, epsilon u, plus epsilon x. So if, that's, if this was my equation, so I had two kinds of noises. I had noise in my actuators, and I had noise in the state. So think about what this means. So this means that epsilon u is going to have variance, right? So which equation here is going to be influenced by this variance? Which of these things that I've written here is going to, is going to change? So this is going to change, right? I'm going to add a term here that's going to be the variance associated with epsilon u times b. Do you see that? So under this circumstance, p of n plus 1 given n is going to be a times p of n given n times a transpose, the variance here, plus the variance of b times epsilon u, which is what? b times variance 
of epsilon u times b transpose plus q. Yeah? Does that make sense? Does any other equation change? I don't think so. I think this is the only equation that changes. OK. All right. So that's a first step for our problem. But we're going to make the problem a little bit harder. Let me describe to you what do I mean by signal-dependent noise. So the kinds of noises that we've been looking at are not really very realistic. So suppose that you have an actuator that produces a force that depends on the input u that you give it but there is some noise here that is going to change based on the input u. So that what, that what I'm trying to write here is a scenario where as the input u increases, the variance of your noise also increases. So imagine a scenario where when you're measuring something, the noise in your measurement is small. So say that the measurement value is, you know, you have a scale. Let me draw it. So suppose you're measuring something. And when the thing is small, it looks like this. But when it increases, it looks like this. And it increases, it looks like this. So the idea is that the noise gets bigger as the signal gets bigger. So that's more realistic, right? That's the kind of thing you're going to more see in nature. So that's not the kind of noises that we've been talking about. The noises that we've been talking about have a variance that is independent of the mean, right? So what I just showed you is that as the mean is small, variance is small. As the mean gets large, variance gets large, right? So that noise is not described by the processes that we've been talking about. This is called signal-dependent noise. What that means is that variance depends on the mean. Variance of the signal depends on the mean. And so I wrote an equation here. Force is equal to u times 1 plus c times phi. So what, what, what I'm writing here, I'm saying that there's a random variable phi. It's normally distributed with mean 0 variance 1. It's going to multiply your input u to give you force. So if I write now variance of force, that's equal to, say that these are scalars. What is that going to be equal to? Variance of this thing on the right side. The only random variable is phi. So variance of the right side of this is going to be u squared c squared times variance of phi, which is 1. So that's u squared c squared. So variance of force is increasing as the input u is increasing. It's going to look like this. This is signal dependent noise. Input u, as it increases, it makes the variance of this equation increase, as I've shown you here. Very exciting. It's worth being awake for, I'm telling you. <laughs> because this is what this is what real signals look like. They don't have variances that are independent of the mean. So let's see how we can handle them. Okay. So let's write down a system that has this kind of noise properties.
So the interesting thing in these equations that I wrote are these noises, epsilon u and epsilon s. So there's something interesting about them. So epsilon x and epsilon y are nothing interesting, as we've seen before. But epsilon u looks like this. So what this is saying is that x is a p by 1 vector. And u is a p by 1 vector. Epsilon u is a noise that's adding to your input. And that noise has this property, where every element of its vector has some gain, c, times u, times the random variable phi where phi i is normal with mirror, z, uh, zero mean and variance one. So this is, you can, see, you can look at this. This looks like this, right? This is u times c times phi. c times u times phi. So the noises are signal dependent. As u increases, the variance of epsilon u is going to increase, right? Because the same as this. Because as u increases, the variance goes up like this. So noise on my input u is signal dependent. Similarly, noise on my state x, this noise here, es. So my measurement is of some input x, right? So I have a sensor that's going to measure something. But that thing that it's measuring, as the signal gets bigger, the noise on it is going to get bigger too. So there are two important concepts here. One, your input to the system, you're giving some input to the system u. You have some actuator that's doing something. The noise in that system depends on the input that you give. If you give it a big input, it's going to give you big noise. You're also measuring something. Why? That depends on the actual state of the system, x. The bigger the state of the system, the bigger the noise in what you're measuring. So epsilon s is going to be d call it psi psi 1 dq xq psi q so this is q by 1 so what you're measuring is q by 1 and it's affected by noise that depends on the state of the system if the state of the system is you know large then the noise that you're going to be measuring is going to be large as well. So this problem that we're looking at is called a dynamical system with signal-dependent noise. And I want to tell you now how do we solve for the common gain for this system? How do we estimate the state of the system? So what's important is that, as always, we're assuming that we know the parameters of the system. So when I write for you A, B, sigmas, and so forth, I have to know the value of a and b and h, and I have to know the covariance of these noises. I have to know the size of these noises. That's how I can compute that q and the, the common gain. So in order for me to, to proceed, what I need to know is that, you know, what am I going to do with these noises? I'm going to have to be able to write the variance of this equation. I'm going to have to write the variance of this equation. And I have this vector that has these um, elements in it. So we have got, we're going to have to make a, a change in nomenclature so we can find the variance of that equation. So let me introduce now a matrix C, call it C1. That's going to have one element. Yeah? I'm sorry. So epsilon s is q by 1, and x is p by 1, and you're adding them together? Uh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, you're right. So. It can't be that way. Yes, you very good point. Yes, so the, the size has to be the same. Mm -hmm. This is definitely so P. X does not need to be P by 1 because B times U can change the dimension of the U. Epsilon U doesn't mean, you mean doesn't have to be P by 1. Yeah, epsilon. Yeah, yeah, because you have the matrix B that can change. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you're absolutely right. So, so I can pick this to be as I wish. So let me let me change it. Yeah, I did it wrong. 
thank you for S on pointing that out. So what I need to have is that if x is p by 1, then this is, say, q by 1, then this is going to be cq, uq, vq. But s has to be the size of x, which is p. Yeah? yeah. Thank you for that. OK. OK, so what I want to do is I want to write epsilon u as the sum of some matrix ci's times the vector u times the scalar phi. And what I'm going to do is that the, and this, this size of u is going to be q by 1. I'm going to define this matrix C that's going to look like this. So it's going to have only one element in there that's not 0. It's the first element. My C2 is going to be a, vector, a matrix that's going to look like this. So forth. So this allows me to write the epsilon u as a sum of a vector u multiplied by a matrix ci times a scalar phi. So vector scalar random variable matrix, like I, like I showed you here. Similarly, I, I can write epsilon s as being the sum of i is equal to 1 to p of some matrix di times vector s x times um, scalar psi, where d1 is d1, 0, 0, 0, d2 is 0, d2, 0, 0, 0, so forth. Now, why am I? Why am I writing? Why am I writing this epsilon s this way? Because I have to find the variance of the equation that says how y of n depends on y s. And why am I writing epsilon u this way? Because I have to write the variance of that x equation, how updated. So for me to write the variance of those equations, it is really helpful to be able to write that the noise is a sum of a matrix times a vector times a scalar. The variance of this equation is just a sum of C transpose, U transpose, variance of phi is 1 times U times CI. So now I can write my variance. So now I have the following dynamics. So let's, let's write the dynamics of my system. So as before, I have a posterior that depends on my prior plus um, some common gain times y of n minus my, my prediction, which is h x of n n minus 1. So what I want to know is, you know, what is, what is k of n? Well, what's y of n? y of n is um, h times um, times the sum of di x of n times psi plus epsilon y minus h x of n and minus 1. 
So I want to find, remember, how do we find the common gain? We find it by minimizing the trace of the posterior. So let's write this in terms of my prior, which is I minus K of N times H, X of N, N minus 1, plus K of N. So this is the equation that's going to now, we're going to use it to define the posterior uncertainty. So the, and now I find the variance of my equation. P of n given n is this, my prior uncertainty times this transpose plus k of n times my uncertainty of this guy. So this, this equation here, k of n transpose. Now, what's variance of this, this quantity on the inside? This vari it's just going to be variance of this plus variance of this. So that's going to be h times the sum of di x of n, x of n transpose di transpose times h plus the variance of this term, qy. H transpose? Yes, thank you. <coughs> okay, so, you know, what do we do? We, we, we multiply through, find the trace of this, find the derivative of that trace, and our result is as follows. I have my common gain that minimizes the trace of the posterior uncertainty is going to look like this. So my prior uncertainty times the variance of my measurement, which is h, p of n, n minus 1, h transpose, plus this term here h times the sum of di x of n, x of n transpose, di transpose, h transpose plus qy inverse. So this is my my measurement noise. And you notice now, my measurement noise has a term in there that we had before. This is just like before. This is just like before. It has a new term here now. This is the, the noise associated with my, with my measurement due to the signal dependent behavior of the noise. So it affects my denominator. It says your common gain is going to be affected not just by your uncertainty of your estimate, but also the fact that you have noise in the variable x that you're trying to estimate that um, is going to grow as the size of that x changes. My posterior uncertainty remains unchanged. And my next trial, my prior, is my posterior on the previous trial plus the input that I gave, but now what changes is my prior uncertainty. Plus B times the variance of the noise, which is the sum of CI U of N, U of N transpose, CI transpose, B transpose, plus Qx. So this is due to signal dependent noise. This is a new term that we didn't have before.
So where did this term come from? Let's just go back and make sure we, we have a sense of where does this come from. So this term here is coming because this term, my dynamics of my system has this noise in it that has a variance. And that variance is this times this times this quantity transpose, which is what this is. So signal-dependent noise, just another noise that affects the dynamics of my system. And I can handle it by being able to write the variance of that equation. And it's going to influence my uncertainty. If noise has no mean, its mean is 0, then it's not going to affect anything associated with the mean estimates of my variable x. The noise in my measurement, if it's signal dependent, is going to influence this weighting that I'm going to have. It's going to make me more uncertain about my measurement. The larger the state of the system, then it's going to produce greater noise in my measurement. So um, signal dependent noise is a property of almost all realistic systems that you interact with. The state, as it gets bigger, it becomes noisier. The input that you give, as it gets bigger, it generates greater noise. And so these are the tools that we need to use for estimating the state of the system in scenarios where things are uh, corrupted by signal-dependent noise. And the problem being that oftentimes, you know, you may not know the parameters of those noise structures. And so that'll be a, one of the problems that we we'll deal with. How do we know the variance of this noise? How do we estimate that? And so we need to first understand how do we measure that. Given that we have that, this is how we um, estimate uh, the state of the system. So typically, the problem looks like this. Um, you don't know the state of your system. And you don't know the dynamics of the system. You don't know the parameters of your system, A, B, noise. You don't know the state of your system, X. What you do is that you, you assume some A, B, and noise. You assume some system to begin with. You say, if this is my system, then this is the best estimate of the state, X, using the common filter. Then what you say, OK, now that I know the state of the system, let's go back and re-estimate the parameters of the system. A, B, C noises and things like that. And then once you have another new estimate of the dynamics, you go back and re-estimate the state using the common filter. Back and forth. That's called expectation maximization, and we'll get to that. So, so far, we've gone over the common filter. How do we estimate the state of the system if we knew precisely the parameters of that system? One of the things that we'll look at is that what if you don't know the parameters of the system? Then what you do is that you make a guess. You make a guess of the parameters of the system, then you estimate the state using the common filter. Now that you have the estimate of state, so if you know x's, right? So look, look at our equations here. So if you knew, oh, sorry. If you knew what x was, x here, you could estimate a and b. If you knew what y was, you can estimate h. And that's how system identification works. You begin with some guess of the parameters that you don't know. You use the common filter to estimate the state, x. Once you have the estimated state, x, you go back and re-estimate the parameters of the system. And you go back and forth, and that's how you do system identification. We'll get to that. Any questions? Yeah? Are c and d both square matrices? Uh, yes. Yes. I think, let, let, let me see. Let me see. Do they have to be square? Um, they are multiplying. So this is a, yeah, they have to be square. Because what we want is, so, so this is a, epsilon u is a q by 1, right? u is, Q by 1. So it has to be a Q by Q. Yeah. So the transposes are the same. The transposes are the same. Yeah. Yeah. In practice, noise is, uh, I think it's, it's, it can be dependent on the frequency of the Not just its magnitude, but its frequency as well. Yeah. 
And, and you know, I haven't thought about that. Yeah, I, so it, it's history, you mean, basically. How quickly it's changing. Yeah. I don't know, I don't know, um, how do you handle that? Yeah, so that, that I don't know. I mean, it has to be written analytically of how it depends on its history. Um, like some kind of filter, you know. Okay, thank you guys. I'll see you Thursday.